invite the guests, parents, family members to please come sit and the chair is provided on the court here for you. You guys want to come over? No? Okay. <laughs> okay. Welcome to Stevensville Middle School's Veterans Day Ceremony. I'd like to welcome parents, family members, guest speakers, kids, students, and our performers and teachers. The observance of Veterans Day debuted in our American calendar in the year 1919, following the end of World War I. But many Novembers ago, in 1783, just six years before he would serve as the first elected leader of this great nation, General George Washington was bidding farewell to the Continental Army. Though George Washington, the nation's first president, preferred the title citizen farmer, he was also a veteran. Washington has stated, the willingness with which our young people are likely to serve in any war, no matter how justified, should be directly proportional to how they perceive veterans of early wars were treated and appreciated by our nation. It is not the sacrifice of one veteran, but of all veterans of all American wars that have afforded us the opportunity to stand here today in freedom. And it is the reason we continue to fight for better, more fulfilling lives in our, for our military veterans and their families. It is our obligation, honor, and duty as grateful Americans. We must take this moment to show our gratitude and respect for all who have served. Would you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now the choir led by Miss Jennifer Stafford will sing the Star Spangled Banner. Civilian life as veterans. 
This is why veterans health care is a top priority for my administration. I have signed legislation that improves accountability at the Department of Veterans Affairs and provide additional funding for the Veterans Choice Program, which ensures veterans continue to receive care in their communities for, from providers they trust. I have also signed legislation to give veterans GI Bill education benefits for their lifetime and legislation to fix the VA appeal process to, to ensure veterans can access the resources they are rightly due. Additionally, this Veterans Day, more than 50 years from the beginning of the Vietnam War, I will be in Da Nang, Vietnam, with leaders of the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum, as we discuss ways to improve economic relationships with the United States and Asia in a country where Americans and Vietnamese once fought a war. We are compelled, compelled to recall and recognize the sacrifice of more than 8 million Vietnam veterans who served here. Beginning with those who arrived at the first American troop deployment in 1965 and ending with those who fought through the ceasefire of 1973. Those men and women dedicated themselves during one of the most challenging periods in our history to promoting freedom across the globe. Many spent years away from their loved ones as they endured the burdens of battle and some experienced profound pain and anguish as their fellow warriors. More than 50,000 of them lost their lives. Some of these heroes have yet to return home as 1,253 of American sons and daughters still remain missing. Along with our Vietnamese partners, however, we continue to work to account for them and to bring them home to American soil. We will not rest until that work is done. With respect for and recognition of the contributions our service members have made to, to the cause of peace and freedom around the world, the Congress has provided that November 11th of each year shall be set aside as a legal public holiday to honor our nation's veterans. As Commander-in-Chief of our heroic armed forces, I humbly thank our veterans and their families as we remember and honor their service and their sacrifice. Now therefore, I, Donald J. Trump, President of the United States of America, do hereby proclaim November 11, 2017 as Veterans Day. I encourage all Americans to recognize the fortitude and sacrifice of our veterans through public ceremonies and private thoughts and prayers. I call upon federal, state, and local officials to display the flag of the United States and to participate in patriotic activities in their communities. I call on all Americans, including civic and fraternal organizations, places of worship, schools and communities support this day with commemorative expressions and programs. In witness therefore thereof, I have hereunto set my hand this seventh day of November in the year of our Lord, 2017, and of the independence of the United States of America, the 242nd. Wagner. We'll now have poetry reading with first Bryce Ravenbosch. Ravenbosch. Yeah. In Flanders Fields is one of the most memorable war poems ever written. The author, Lieutenant Colonel John McRae was a surgeon in Flanders during World War I. Although he had been a doctor for years, he found it impossible to get used to the suffering and blood there. One death particularly affected McRae. A young friend and former student of his was killed by a shell burst on May 2, 1915, and McRae performed the funeral ceremony in absence of the chaplain. The next day, McRae vented his anguish by composing a poem in the nearby cemetery. Cemetery, 
He could see the so he could see the wild poppies in the ditches, and he spent twenty minutes of precious rest time scribbling the lines in the notebook. The poem was very very nearly not published. Dissatisfied with it, McRae tossed it away. But a fellow officer retrieved it and sent it to the newspapers in England. It was pub it was published on December eighth, nineteen fifteen. In Flanders Fields by John McCray. In Flanders Fields the poppies glow between the crosses round and round that mark our place and in the sky the larks still bravely sing and fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow. Loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe, to you from failing hands we throw. The torch be yours to hold it high, and if ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep through poppies grow in Flanders fields. Now Aaron Avia, will you taps? Am I pronouncing it correctly? Avilia? Avila. Avila. Okay, Avila. We'll be performing tabs in the phone. Speaker, Mr. Ralph Bateman. He is a Vietnam combat inf infantryman with the United States Army. I'd like to thank you all for this honor and um, the words that I say I hope honor all veterans. Um, I'm not a natural uh, giver of speeches, so try to keep it simple and just explain my time pretty much in the Army, what I did, and some of the things about the way it was back in those days. Um, I felt like the best way to do it was probably to recite some of the letters that I sent home to my parents and friends, which explained what I did and the environment and the people that I interacted with. On the 27th of February, 1969, I took a bus from the Annapolis Post Office up to Fort Holloway. Uh, I got a physical, uh, raised my hand, and took the oath to protect and defend the United States of America. I then boarded another bus and went to Fort Bragg, North Carolina for basic training. Basic training is basically physical uh, exercises, discipline, physical exercises, um, and getting preliminary uh, familiarization with weapons. After nine weeks of that, I took a bus and went to Fort Dix, New Jersey, uh, where it was advanced individual training. For me, it was advanced infantry training. Uh, primarily, they just got us uh, more familiar with the weapons we would use in Vietnam, M16, M14, M60 machine gun, M79, grenade launcher, grenades, and um, some of the other things that we need to live by day to day. Um, then on 25 July 1970, I boarded a plane and left the what was the Friendship Airport, now BWI, and headed for Vietnam. When I arrived in Vietnam, I joined the AmeriCal Division, the 23rd Infantry, the 11th Light Infantry Brigade, 4th of the 21st Infantry, Delta Company, 1st Platoon. The main thing you learned as soon as you got into the field was you needed to get the respect of the guys that were around you because they protected you every day and 
they expected you to protect them. The main thing that they taught me immediately was keep up, keep quiet, and stay awake doing your guard duty. Because after humping 75 pounds of deer all day long, I was trying to stay awake two hours during the night and making sure that you protect everybody that's around you is one of the most important things you have to do. It's not shooting anybody, but it's a thing that basically binds a brotherhood together. On the 21st of August, 1969, my letter to my dad, Thursday, I received your letter. I was on a day-long patrol, and by the time I returned, it was dark. So I had to put off writing until today. I'm just sitting in the sun, writing and trying to improve my tan. Luckily, I haven't been burned, except my lower lip, did not that a food? We'll be coming out of the field on the 27th or 28th, and we'll go to fire support base Debbie to pull guard for seven days, which is almost like a vacation. Then we go on a three-day stand-down, probably to Chulai, where we get free beer and soda, with ice, with a luxury, and freedom to do anything we want. Well, not really. They take our weapons away to keep us from getting too rowdy. On the tan, I'll drop you in line and let you know if, it, if the tan washes off. To say the least, I'm dirty. We only have enough water to drink because it has to be brought in by chopper. Even out here in the field, they try to get us mail, water, beer, and soda every day. When stand down, I'll get to take a, get, I'll try to get a camera and send home some shots of this place. I'm sitting on a hill now, about two or three miles from the South China Sea. The sea is beautiful from here and covers most of the horizon. I'm in the fourth squad, weapon squad, and I carry an M60 machine gun. I'm an assistant machine gunner and hump a spare barrel, asbestos gloves, 300 rounds of M60 ammunition, and my M60. I get tired fast because we only hump up and down hills, which makes it worse. But when I have the 60, I have more firepower than anyone else in the platoon. It's bad. I hope that the rest of my time in the field is like this. Since I've been here, my platoon hasn't made any solid contact with the VC. All the other platoons have. Maybe we can stay clean for another six or seven days. We've been camping at the same location for three days. That's good and bad. Not much humping, and the spots get familiar, but also the VC know exactly where our positions are by now. Unless we're sneaky with our trip flares and Claymore mines, the enemy will also know where they are set. It gets very dark at night, and we're very dependent on trip flares and claymores. The enemy has been known to turn claymores around to face our position and then trip a flare on purpose. If the claymore is blown, they can wipe out the whole position. I've been going down the last two evenings and changing the setup and locations of our trip flares every night. Everyone here calls me Batman. I tossed the hard hat the first week I was in the field, and my sweatband is my only head gear. Most of us only wear t-shirts on patrol or around the campsite. My hands and arms are crisscrossed with cuts from elephant grass. On the top part of my arm are small blisters from the heat and sun. I didn't mean to stretch this out, but usually I have no spare time and hope that you enjoyed the description. I probably won't have another chance to write before bumper guard. Say hi to Uncle Ken and Ethel and all. Thank you enough for a car. I'll be seeing you in about 340 days. Peace. <laughs> 27 September 1969. I didn't get the radio job, some sort of politics involved. My squad leader forgave, uh, refused to give me up. By the time I talked my squad leader into letting me go, the job was taken. So I talked the squad leader into letting me be transferred to first squad as 18 leader. It seems I can read a map better than anyone in the platoon, so when we go out on patrol, I'm responsible for us getting to where we're supposed to go. I also am now usually on point. This puts me in charge of my element. When we go out on platoon or company-sized patrols, 18 first squad, first platoon, supplies point because we're always first in line. Since I'm, in the team, since I'm the team lead, it's up to me to pick the man to walk point. And since I enjoy walking point, I usually am up front. If a good man is good enough at point, he won't get hurt. And he can also be the person to save the element from disaster by keeping his eyes and ears open. Point has its compensations. I'll probably get a promotion by, the time next, by this time next month. Today, third platoon, though, came under heavy fire. 
But so far, no one's been hurt. We are on standby status because of this. E Company, Recon, was hit Thursday and Friday and lost 12 men. This might affect what we do the next week or so. My old platoon leader is now a company's commanding officer. And someone stole my pants on stamp now and got my keys and the calendar you sent. I recovered my wallet, but everything was soaked. I love the camera and keep it in my ammo pouch and try to take it out on patrols. Those packages of Kleenex are great for padding. Be good, and I'll see you in 302. From that point, my unit got out of the field, and we became what was known as a pacification unit. We became embedded in a village. The village was my train. And our job was to teach the local militia how to do military operations and how to handle weapons. This is a letter from my time in the village. This is to my friends, Keith and Judy. 21 October, 1969, Tuesday. Right after mailing off your letter, the day before yesterday, I got your letter. That seems to be how it happens around here. A couple of things have happened in the last few days that sort of mix me up. Remember, we're in the Ville now. Yesterday, a bunch of people carried a boy into the Ville with third degree burns on 80% of his body. It was thought that the boy, along with two others, stepped on a booby trap. Well, the kid was right messed up and we called him medevac. It was given regular priority and would have taken them two hours to get here. I was on the radio trying to get help and one of the guys from the tomb flagged down a jeep on the road next to the bill and they took the kid to Duck Phil. The kid was alive when he left here thanks to our medic, Doc Wallace. Then they brought in another boy who was also burnt bad, but his feet were almost blown off. I called the medevac again, but they told me to wait. When they told me this, I was standing there with a kid with our medic, working his butt off to keep him alive. Then they bring in the third kid, and he's burned his bed, but he has a broken leg with the bone sticking out. He went into shock as soon as he got to the bill. Our medic did everything he could, including giving the kid mouth to mouth. But the kid threw up in Doc's mouth, which made Doc throw up. When the kid stopped breathing again, Doc asked for a big pen, broke off the end, and stuck it in the kid's neck, which freaked me out. And then we heard the kid breathing again. I saw a chopper flying overhead and contacted Powell, letting me know what we were dealing with. He told me that he was transporting some officers and couldn't stop to help us. I went ballistic and threatened to shoot him out of the air. And fortunately, the pilot had a heart. We brought the chopper in and the pilot warned me to throw the kids on quickly because he had a couple of pissed off officers behind him. The chopper never touched the ground and one of the officers threw up when he saw the busted up kids that we tossed on to it. I was contacted the pilot as he was leaving and he told me to tell him next time it's an emergency back and don't take any shit. We received word later that the boys were thought to have been enemy and were probably setting up a QB trap that went off accident. But they were kids, about six, seven, or eight years old, and I have difficulty handling this. To top it off, we got hit again last night. No one hurt, two BC dead, one wounded. This morning, second platoon went out, and a friend of mine stepped on a booby trap and was killed. What am I supposed to do? Why do we have such incompetent leaders? The officers in charge don't have any brains, just time and service. Sorry, but I get down every now and then and need to let off steam. Thanks for listening. And I'll write you a happy letter next time. 25th November, 1969. Tuesday, Dad, I got a package from you, Miss Poggins, today. My only suggestion is to send larger bottles of booze. Miniatures don't go very far, but we can't get anything like that out here, so please don't misunderstand. We really enjoy what you sent us as we sit around after supper. Since I don't have to hump anymore, I'll take all, all that you can send. Ms. Coggins, who made cookies with the greatest. Don't worry about my mail if I get transferred. A good friend of mine works in the mail room. Our platoon has moved to another village, and we're working with regional forces, and these guys are pretty good. They don't steal from us, and we get along really well. Language is no barrier. Almost every night, we have a picked up volleyball game right in the compound, regional forces versus GIs. It's great fun, and everybody that isn't playing sits around and cheers us on. 21 April, 1970.
Tuesday, that here I am in true life on sham time. Sham time is any time you should be in the field, but find a way to get to the rear. We figure that we owe it to ourselves. Things have changed since my last letter. A couple of weeks ago, we did a booby trap along the Rice Bowl Ridge Line. Our Kit Carson scout was killed. Our lieutenant and RTO got ticket home wounds. Doc got a piece of shrapnel on his leg. He was behind me, and the guy in front of me, Dan, got two pieces in his shoulder and a chunk in his shin. Doc is fine and walked back to the building with a stick. Dan should be back in May. I was lucky. The four guys in line in front of me got hit, the two guys behind me. A couple weeks ago, Charlie Company went up the same hill and tripped a 105 millimeter booby trap. They're carrying mortar rounds and claymores, which exploded when the booby trap went off. <coughs> they had 14 killed and 34 wounded. A week earlier, they hit a command detonated 500 pound bomb and killed eight. Charlie Company has had some bad luck. And their company strength is down to about 60 men. The plan now is to move Delta Company out of the bills and move the beat up Charlie Company in. Delta Company would go back to patrolling the mountains, but I hope not. I'm too short. But it's not like I have a choice. I went to the dentist and told him that my tooth needed to be pulled, but they couldn't pull it because I'd be on the field too long. I really don't see a problem with that. I was told to get you to take it care of as soon as I got back to the world. When we go back out to the field, we keep the cat packages small and simple. At the end of my tour, after they pulled us out of the village, we were primarily a CERC team, a short-range reconnaissance patrol. Um, primarily an Indian team that was dropped into uh, behind enemy lines to do recon and to set booby traps and ambushes. 6 May 1970, Wednesday. Dad, I'm sitting in a valley surrounded by mountains with a gentle brook running through. It's a beautiful sight and also a free fire zone. We shoot anything that moves. Every day that we've been out, we've had contact. But, to, but today, nothing. The area should be loaded with NBA, but all we can do is cross our fingers. I plan to enroll at Anne Arundel Community College for the spring, spring semester. The Army will drop the end of my enlistment if I enroll full-time in college. I've just finished taking a bath in the stream, and it's the first time in six days I've been clean. But I had to burn five leeches off my legs to pay that price. I also wash my clothes. I think I'll grow a beard. I just play, finished playing some cards, so here's a check that should help. We play poker, and I won sometimes. It's 27 June 1970, Dad. 29 days left. I go in the rear for a job in two days. I just have to make it through these last two days and nights. We hit a booby trap yesterday and lost five guys. They will all be okay. I'm scared, and all the faith in the world can't change that. I just have to keep it under control for two more days. I can't imagine what it's like. Usually I don't have too much trouble, but during the days, it's not too bad. The nights are just too long. I haven't gotten too much sleep in the last two weeks. But I found my wallet, and none of the money was there. But I think I'll get a motorcycle when I get back because it can't be any more dangerous than this. I, I, I read the, the letter from, from you all, and I really appreciate it. And there was a, there was a couple books that I wanted to, to reference if you all wanted to do any reading. Um, and unfortunately, I didn't write down the, the name. Things That They Carried, which, uh, which I believe was uh, written by a gentleman from my unit, uh, which basically talks about an infantryman, things they carry in the back, things they carry in their minds. And it's a very good book. Uh, if you want to read a book about being embedded in, in the Vietnamese village, once I was a warrior king. Excellent book. And finally, there's a book out there which I'm a little involved with. In my, in, at the end of my tour, we ambushed an NBA group, and we we um, we killed an NBA doctor, and her uh, her diaries were recovered, and 
translated. And the, the book they're translated into is called Last Night I Dreamed of Peace. It's a very, very one-sided book that re reflects the VC and the A side of the war and how they saw us. It's a brutal read, but it's, it's, it's the second side. Um, I thank you very much, and um, uh, I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Bateman. Thank you for coming. The Stevens Middle School Band will now perform service medley led by Mr. Ryan Zidell. Mr. Floyd, how are you? Oh, I'm still kicking. <laughs> uh, I'm kicking around. How many years have you been doing this? I don't know how many years I've been doing this, but I'm 80 years old. There you go. I guess I've been doing it for a while. Yeah, uh huh. <laughs> I miss your dad, though. I know, I know. He, he, he loved this. He did love this part. Okay. Uh, nowadays, the fight in the course is all over in the Mideast. And this is what the people in Africa, men, men and boys in Afghan, Afghanistan or uh, Iraq, areas like that, would wear this. They would also wear, the boys would wear this cap. And the other, this cap here is National Police. This cap here would be worn by men in, the, in those areas of the world. Over here, this is probably one of the more interesting things in that area of the world. This is a burqa. Now, in, the, in their society, in the Muslim society, a girl, until she reaches 16, can dress in a regular dress with her head exposed. After they're 16, 
they have to wear the burqa. They're going outside. They also cannot go outside without a male relative of their family. The only person who ever sees the woman's face is her husband. The rest of the family don't see her. She has to wear this. Now, this goes from head to toe, and the only thing she's got to look out through is this little grill. She also breathes through that. Temperature in those countries during the day is 125 degrees. Gals, count yourself lucky you don't have to dress like that. Because that is, that is Muslim law. That's the way they dress. Over here on this table here, by that, it's all my stuff from my time in the service. When I, when I turned 17, I was in the 11th grade and I enlisted in the Marine Reserves. I did, I enlisted for three years. <laughs> And I did my three years, that in 1954. In 1957, I went on active duty. I went and signed for six years that time. Give me a total service time of nine years. I had planned on making a career out of it. I went back for my next enlistment, and they told me my left knee was blown. It was pretty much mush, and I had a hole in my eardrum. Uh, so I was out. Both my knees have been replaced. I'm walking around with steel, steel nylon. Now, over here in this case is things that pertain to the Marine Corps, starting with the Civil War. This little badge here was what would have been worn on their caps. The three holes, they would have either had an ammo in there or they would have had the little, looks like a French horn infantry uh, bugle. The Eagle Glove and Anchor didn't come along until 1868, three years after the Civil War. The two shoulder knots are from the Spanish-American War, 1898. And the little patch in the middle was World War II, Guadalcanal First Edition. Over here, my family, we've all served. And this picture here was taken at Lexington and Howard Street. Your father is well familiar with that. It was taken on VE Day, the day the Germans surrendered in World War II. It's a Bodine picture. Uh, Bodine was a photographer for the Sun paper who took a lot of Maryland scene. This one here, I was leaving for Paris off. There was a photographer at the bottom of the steps. I didn't notice him. He took our picture. It appeared in the Sun paper. I came home on leave. My mother said, hey, tell me your, your picture was in the Sun paper. But we don't take the Sun paper, we take the news post. But they were good enough that when they sent a series of these pictures down to the Marine Reserve, which I had been in for three years, and they recognized me and they sent the picture to my mother. <laughs> so that's how I got that. And this was my boot camp picture. This is when I graduated. This was 13 weeks after this. Anything else here? The dummy grenade was just used so you could get the feel of the weight of the grenades that you were supposed to be using. If you saw any of the movies out of World War II where John Wayne pulled the pin out, he would have also pulled his teeth out because you can't use your teeth to pull the pin on the grenade. They had what they called a spoon along the back. Inside was like a cigarette lighter. Once the spoon flew off, it ignited a spark, which would light a little fuse, which would go down in there, cause the explosion. Had three seconds to get rid of it. They, uh, like I say, if you pulled the pin, or getting ready to throw it, and your target disappeared, you didn't have a target anymore. As long as you're holding it like this, and holding this down, you can put the pin back in, it's safe. This is a clip from the M1 rifle. When I was in, we were armed with M1 rifles. Each one of these things held eight 30 odd 6 rounds. Usually what we used was armor Paracin rounds, black tip. It would go through a quarter inch steel plate or 14 inches of wood. And we were always told if you're gonna hide behind the tree, make sure it's at least 15 inches. <laughs> The most important thing on here is on that yellow car. That's the can opener. <laughs> we ate out of cans, see rations. And if you didn't have your can opener, you didn't eat. 
So we, can, we safeguarded that P-38. Took 38 punches to open the can. We used to put them on a keychain up inside the helmet. In those days, we wore steel helmets.